Okay, this is the life and work of Jesus. This is part 31. Our scripture this week comes from Mark 12, verses 13 through 17. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Now, before I go on, I need to explain that this was a trap. It was intended as a trap. And when they come to Jesus and they say, we know you are a man of integrity, they're lying. They don't know that. They don't believe that. They may believe that he's not swayed by others because they pay, he pays no attention to who they are because he hasn't paid attention to them. He hasn't changed his opinions or what he says because of them, because they've told him several times he shouldn't be saying the things he's saying. And they certainly don't believe that he teaches the way of God in accordance with the truth. They actually believe quite the opposite of that. But by asking the question that way, remember, they're asking that question in the presence of a crowd. When Jesus was in Jerusalem, after he entered Jerusalem uh, about a half a chapter ago, um, and in the week or weeks he spent in Jerusalem uh, before the Passover, he would gather, he would go to public places, sometimes, often, the courtyard in front of the temple, a public place where people would gather. And people would gather around him and listen to him, and he would tell some of the stories and preach some of the sermons uh, that he preached during the previous three years, wandering through Galilee and Samaria and uh, the Transjordan. And he would answer questions and talk to people. And during that time, Pharisees and rabbis and other people came to him and talked to him and sometimes challenged him. So there was a crowd around, maybe not more than 30 or 40 people, but maybe as many as 200. There was a crowd around when they came and asked this question. So by speaking politely, by referring to his integrity, by referring to his teaching the way of God with the truth, they're putting him on notice and putting the crowd on notice that, hey, we're going to check this guy out. If we think that he speaks the word of God in accordance with the truth, let's see what he says next. Is that going to be the word of God in accordance to the truth? So now, having spread a little honey on the tongue, they ask the trapping question, is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? And this is why it's a trap. You see, the crowds think that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus has not publicly claimed to be the Messiah, although he's privately allowed his disciples to realize that he is. But he also knows that the crowds believe that he's maybe may be the Messiah, and he knows that the Pharisees and the rabbis and the chief priests and the people on the council are concerned that he might be claiming to be the Messiah, and the Messiah is the one who is going to throw off the Roman rule. The Messiah is the one who's going to raise up the kingdom of Israel again and set the country free from the Romans so that it doesn't have to pay the imperial tax to Caesar. That's not the only reason to throw off the rule of the Romans, but one of the things that would mean is that the real Messiah would raise up the country and throw off the Roman rule, and then no one would pay the imperial tax tomorrow. So the trap here is that they're saying, hey, look, if you're the Messiah, you have to tell us not to pay the tax because God's people shouldn't pay a tax to foreigners and Gentiles, and oppressors. On the other hand, if you say that we shouldn't pay the tax, you're now in danger of the Roman rule. You're now in danger of being arrested and executed as a revolutionary, as a rebel. 
But if you say that we should pay the tax in order to avoid that, then you're proving to the people that you're not the Messiah. If you say that we should be the pay the tax, then the people will know that you're not really the Messiah, or at least we hope that's what the people will know. We hope that that's the way the people will react. Now, Jesus could have ducked out from under this trap. It wouldn't be that hard. Anyone who thinks about it for a moment could say, hey, for now, the tax should be paid. For now, we have to go through with this. And then say no more than that. And if they ask, well, if not now, when will it change? Thus challenging him to announce that sooner or later he's going to start a rebellion. And he could say, who can see the future? When the time comes, then we will know. He could have sidestepped the problem that way. And remember too, this question is a problem for Jesus. But it's not a problem for the Pharisees. It's not a problem for the rabbis. It's not a problem for the chief priests and the members of the council because they aren't claiming to be the Messiah. They only claim to be teaching God's word. So they've laid a trap for him. And although there are possible ways out of the trap, Jesus could have sidestepped it in a way somewhat like what I just described. But he doesn't sidestep the trap that way. Here's what he does. But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a coin, bring me a denarius, and let me look at it. They brought a coin, and he asked them, whose image is this on this coin, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Now look, you've got to understand, Jesus has now turned the trap back around on the Pharisees and the rabbis and the chief priests and the members of the council. He's turned the trap back around on them because he says of the coin, here's the coin. You've seen coins and pictures of coins. Our coins have George Washington on them and Abraham Lincoln on them and Thomas Jefferson on them. And the coins in those days had Caesar on them. Caesar Augustus was the most common coin with a picture of Caesar on it at the time of Jesus. Um, and an inscription, you know, saying this is Rome. You know, coin is, this is Caesar Augustus. This is uh, the Roman uh, ruler. Um, and he says, okay, whose image is on this coin? Well, if the coin belongs to the Romans, if the Roman Empire made the coin and distributed the coin, then if the Roman Empire says, hey, one of the things this coin is supposed to use, be used for is to pay the tax, well, okay, it's their tax. But then Jesus says, so give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. That last thing about give to God what is God's has a sting in it. Because if we give the coin to Caesar, because the coin has God's Im has Caesar's image on it, then the question arises, what is it that we should give to God? Answer, we should give to God the thing that has God's image on it. Well, what has God's image on it? What did we read this morning? What does every Jew standing in that courtyard know? What does every rabbi and Pharisee who reads their Bible all the time and every priest and every member of the council and probably every one of the poor working people in the council know? That incredible passage from the beginning of Genesis where God says, I make human beings in my image. In my image, they are created. Well, we just referred to image with the coin so image comes out right now. What is there present here right now that has God's image on it? The Pharisees have God's image on them. The rabbis have God's image on them. The chief priests and the members of the council and all the people listening 
are in the image of God. That's what must be given to God. That is what belongs to God and must be given to him. Not the sacrifice of pigeons in the temple, not the sacrifice of a bull or a lamb or a goat at the seasons of the year and at the major festivals. That's only a symbol of what's supposed to be given to God. It is ourselves that are supposed to be given to God. It is the very people who are challenging Jesus who are to be given to God, who are to give themselves to God. And the implied criticism, and everyone standing there would have recognized the implied criticism. The implied criticism is that the Pharisees and the rabbis are not giving themselves to God. They are acting as if their lives belonged to themselves. They are holding themselves back. If they were giving themselves to God, then they would have recognized that Jesus' ministry comes from God, if they were giving themselves to God, then they would have celebrated when people were healed instead of fussing about what day the Sabbath was. If they were giving themselves to God, then they would be giving themselves to take care of the widow and the orphan and the poor and the oppressed to help the people around them instead of ruling the people around them. Jesus turns the trap back on them, and they're amazed, and the crowd is amazed too. They're amazed and hurt and angered. The crowd is amazed and excited and, and enheartened because the thing Jesus does to turn this around on the people to try to trap them makes the crowd realize that this might be easier than they thought. The Pharisees and the rabbis and the chief priests and the counselors on the Sanhedrin are middle class or rich. They have a lot they might have to give up if they gave themselves to God, but the working poor have nothing to lose. And if all they have to give to God is themselves, then what they have to give to God is something that they've got not something that they don't have. The people who have to buy a pigeon because they can't afford a lamb for the sacrifice. The people who have to buy a dove because they can't afford a goat or a lamb can afford to give themselves to God. So what is this for us? I mean, the message is that we have to give ourselves to God. Okay, of course we do. Obviously, we do. We know that. We've known it for all our lives, or at least ever since we started being serious about our Christian faith. We have to give ourselves to God, but what does that mean? And what do we give ourselves to God as? Do we give ourselves to God as slaves? Does giving ourselves to God mean we have to stop doing the other things we're doing and spend our time only obeying God, looking up every commandment we can find in the Bible? and doing all the things that God says everywhere throughout the scripture. Does that mean that our whole lives have to become one of looking for commands of God and obeying those commands because we are God's servants and God's slaves? Again, look back to the scripture that we started with this morning in Genesis. God did not create us to be slaves in the first place. God created us to give us authority and rule and power and might and choice. The creation myths of the nations around Israel frequently picture creation as being the result of a battle between the gods and the monsters and human beings having been created at the end of that battle to be the servants of the gods, to be slaves to the gods. That was the background against which the story of the beginning of all things and of the creation and of the creation of human beings was told. And in the Hebrew story, God creates human beings in order to love them, in order to fellowship with them, in order to give them freedom and power and authority, not in order to be slaves. God created us to love us, 
So the right metaphor for giving ourselves to God is not that we give ourselves to God as slaves to their masters. We give ourselves to God as we give ourselves to one another in a marriage. The Song of Solomon is about God's love for us being as strong and as rich and as intimate as the relationship between lovers. And Paul affirms this and says that the Song of Solomon is a metaphor for the love of Christ for his church. We give ourselves to God as we give ourselves to one another in a marriage. We give ourselves to God as we give ourselves to one another in friendship, as we give ourselves to our friends. The story of David and Jonathan in the Old Testament is a story of a friendship that endured despite terrible things that could have torn it apart, despite the fact that Jonathan was the heir to the kingdom, but the kingdom was being torn away from his father and given to David and not Jonathan. And Jonathan loved David so much that it didn't matter to him that the kingdom was being given to David. Jesus says to his disciples at the Last Supper, he says, I have not called you servants. I have not called you my slaves. I have called you friends. I have told you everything I am doing and why I am doing it so that you can do it with me, not as servants, but as friends and fellow workers. We give ourselves to God as we give ourselves to our parents or our children. The scripture talks about God being our father and us being God's children all over the place. I don't have to come up with examples. We give ourselves to God as we give ourselves to our parents and children. We give ourselves to God as we give ourselves to our families, our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, our aunts and our uncles. And we know that this kind of self-giving in these kinds of relationships doesn't erase our freedom doesn't ruin our lives, doesn't mean that we can't make our own choices, choose our own careers, make our own decisions about what to do and what not to do, about what recreation to do and what time, one time to do work. It does obligate us to take all those people into account in making those decisions. Giving ourselves to them does mean that we think about them, we consult them, we consider their needs when we make our decisions, but we still make our decisions in freedom. And we do what we do for them out of love, not out of slavery. So I ask you, have you thought about God today as often as you think about your family members? Have you talked to God as often as you talk to your siblings or your best friends? Have you listened to God as often and as carefully as you listen to your spouse? Sometimes you can be super efficient. You can do both together. You can listen to your spouse and to God at the same time. One of the reasons why I love Linda so dearly is that she talks to me in such a way that sometimes listening to her is listening to God for me because of who she is and because of who God is and because of who God is using her to be for me. Sometimes these things fit together and reinforce one another. Have you spent time with God as you spend time with family and friends and spouses and lovers? And look, when you spend time with family and friends and spouses and, and, and whatever, you don't spend that time in such a way that you can't do anything else. You spend it in such a way that you can get your work done while you're working with them. You can take your recreations as you take your recreations with them. You can make your own decisions about where to go and what to do because some of those decisions and some of those things you do and some of those places you go, you take family and friends with you. Giving yourself to God and spending time with God as you spend it with your family and friends and spouses doesn't mean 
that you can't do anything else, that you have to become a monk or a nun, that you have to do nothing but pray and get down on your knees and serve in a convent or a monastery. You give yourself to God everywhere you are, in everything you do. And a lot of those things you do will be the same things that you would have done if you weren't giving yourself to God, but they will be done differently by you because you know and you understand that you're doing them in the presence of God, because the presence of God is to you like that song in your head that goes on and on in the background of everything, and it comes back to your thoughts whenever there's a gap, and that you wake up with in the morning. The presence of God becomes something that accompanies you all the time, everywhere, in everything you do, not something that you must leave your life behind in order to get to. So what are you going to do about it? Because I presume that the answer to all these questions that I've just asked you is no, because I know it's not so even for me. I don't think about God as often as I think about family. I don't talk to God as often as I talk to Linda, or even as often as I talk to some of my friends in the presbytery, I don't listen to God as often and as carefully as I listen to Linda. I do a fair bit of it. I hope and like to think that I do a lot of it, but I don't do as much of it as that. So what are we going to do in order to do that better and in order to do that more? There are people who do that. I spoke uh, of nuns and monks and so on earlier saying you don't have to do that in order to be spending all your time with God. But some of those people actually in those religious lives do a really good job of living their lives in the presence of God better than most of us. Mind you, it's a little bit easier for them in separated out places of living, but other people do. Um, Linda's grandmother, her, her father's mother, at least when I first knew Linda's grandmother, when she was older and retired and, and didn't have to do other things, she lived in the presence of God an awful lot. She couldn't get around and do stuff, so she set herself the task of keeping up with all the prayers that everyone in the family and everyone that she knew needed. She spent as many hours a day reading the Bible and praying for other people as you or I spend at our jobs. There are people like that. It does go on. It's not impossible. In practical terms, there are three things that you need to do. You need to make sure that you take time to pray, and then you need to practice how those specific times of prayer can set you up so that prayer is available in your mind as something to do at any time. So that you can at any moment during the day, while driving to work, while standing in line at the grocery store, while washing the dishes, open the door to prayer in your mind and do some of it. You need to do some Bible reading. You really need to do some Bible reading. If all the Bible you hear is the Bible that you get in church on Sunday, then you need to do some more Bible reading. That requires taking time and separating yourself from doing other things. Sometimes that is what it takes. And you need to fellowship with other Christians. And when I say fellowship with other Christians, I don't just mean go play Settlers of Catan with them. I mean, yes, go play with them. Yes, go hang around and talk with them. But the playing and the talking should sometimes turn out to include talking about what's really going on in your life. Talking about what's really going on in your life in the light of who God is and with respect to what Jesus Christ has done for you and how Jesus Christ has changed your life. And all of those things need to be done often enough that they become a pattern in your thoughts and a pattern in your feelings that plays itself around again and again so that it is at your service as often 
and as easily as the song that you sing. Amen. Um, Andrew?